This is interesting. <laughs> I have never done anything like this. I don't. I can't explain the pull that I feel towards being out here. There's nowhere else I'd rather be. Someday, Someday this journey will be remembered as, as our legacy west. The formation here is known as Ancient Ruins Bluff. The Vanguard expedition passed here on May 22, 1847, and gave it that name because they thought it resembled the ruins of an ancient city. The face of the land had certainly changed from the farms of eastern Nebraska they left behind. This was a land of mystery. Along the trail, they found the bones of animals, many of which were petrified. According to their journals, this was a place of buffalo, rattlesnakes, and antelope. A land of desert flowers, sagebrush, and buffalo grass. For the reenactment company, the excitement of new sites was similar. The farmlands to which they were accustomed were now transformed into the majestic vistas of open prairies. On May 26, the cold, rainy Monday, leaving the Ash Hollow area, they made their way to Oshkosh, from Oshkosh to Lisco, from Lisco to Broadwater. Here the landmark bluffs of western Nebraska were in sight. From Broadwater they traveled to Bridgeport, and from Bridgeport through Bayard and into Scott's Bluff. The borders of Wyoming would be less than 50 miles away. With each passing day, the trail reveals its own enveloping magic its ever-changing visage. Its beauty is suddenly juxtaposed by hidden dangers, its tenderness by severity. The perils of illness and accident are coupled with the joys of newfound friendship or romance. Its colorful sunrises followed by sudden storms. In this respect, the trek of 1847 was no different from the present reenactment. The role of the outrider is to help teamsters control horses in times of need. But in a land of prairie dog holes, even the best of riders encounter the hidden dangers of the trail. As the wagon train moved across the prairie of northwest Nebraska, Walter Okamoto was thrown from his horse. Fearing his leg was broken, he was stabilized and taken quickly to a hospital. I have a break. I go two meters, maybe. Uh, yes. You hear a break? Yes. Yes. His leg break? I, I, I think so. I'd had broken bones before. And, uh, Do you want another blanket? It felt to me like it was broken. Careful there, guys. Are you crazy? I'm sorry. It's all right. He's much more. Uh, yeah, that, would, that wouldn't be a bad idea. After they put me in the van, uh, Bruce Newbold and President Cornell, Jared Cornell, gave me a blessing. And in the blessing, uh, I was given certain promises, and I could feel, I could just feel the spirit. I could feel the pain subsiding quite a bit. The first x-ray didn't turn out. I mean, they got an absolute blank on it. And they had to check the machine and, and get it working again. And so by the time they took the second set of x-ray, uh, the pain had just come to a change to a dull ache where there was no sharp pain or numbness or anything. All the numbness had gone away. And the x-ray showed that it was, the bone was perfectly straight. <laughs> <laughs> Though there is no escaping the dangers of wagon train travel, the trek is also replete with happy experiences. Lifelong friendships are established as selfless acts of kindness ease the burden of daily struggles. But sometimes those friendships become a bit more serious. Just right out here. We're walking over to the Presbyterian Church to where they're going to sleep in the basement. We're cutting across the fields of the town, and, we, and uh, we're in the middle of this field. I've been carrying the ring around in my pocket for about a week. And so we're in the middle of this field. Grass was tall. The meadow larks were singing. It was almost twilight, but it was still kind of light. And it was just perfect. And so I started taking off my backpack, took off my hat, and I said, Amy, 
I spoke with your father last night on the phone, and he gave his consent for us to marry. He asked me out there in that field, and uh, I said yes with absolutely no hesitation. <laughs> He's wonderful. I got down on my knee and asked her to marry me. It's a prairie diamond. It's a little horseshoe nail that's turned into a ring. Kind of a good old-fashioned trail wedding thing, I guess. But we're not getting married on the trail. <laughs> we're going to wait till we get home. These are divining rods. Some people call them witching rods. They're just a couple of bent hangers. Over the years, people have used these to discover underground water, buried pipelines, sometimes graves. Trail enthusiasts sometimes use them to try to discover the old ruts, the old trail. Some people swear by them, but there is no scientific evidence that they work. But when we went back to Joe Reyes property to study the ruts, some interesting things happened. The wagon ruts of the original trail run directly through Joe Reyes property. In most places, they're visible. But in areas where the location of the ruts was in question, the divining rods provided some astounding results. I had never used divining rods before, but after having seen the rods cross and uncross in Brian Hill's hands, I wanted to see what they would do in mine. Look at that. It's amazing. Even Joe Reyes and his wife gave the rods a try. Amazing. Amaz it's doing it on its own. This is interesting. <laughs> I have never done anything like this. Never. It brings history back into the hearts of people that uh, walk through this trail. After having seen the consistency of the rods in locating the ruts, Brian Hill ventured an attempt at finding the exact site of the pioneer grave. Right there in that dip. That, you're right. Right there in that dip, right, right here. Right here on this dip. Yep. You watch this way. Okay. Just look at the, the size. Mm -hmm. this just gets, you know, this would be very typical because the, uh, mm -hmm. they bury a child right near the trail. Mm -hmm. Sometimes on a hillside, if there was a good mm -hmm. place, Sometimes you'll find trails that go up to yeah. the tops of hills and they find graves sure. on those places sure. in Iowa. But here, I mean, just uh, 50 feet from the trail. Well, I think we ought to, why don't you move it, Joe? I think you're the one. <laughs> you're the one that found right it. No, I think you've, you've taken care of it. Oh my land, sitting there. You just found a stone, didn't you? Somewhere on your property, is that I right? sure did. And it's, that's perfect for it until they do something else. He'll remain there. He'll remain there. Who owns the trail? I think the pioneers of America and the people that courageously made that, that walk. It belonged to all of us. Of the women on the trail, it can truthfully be said that they were certainly as stalwart, brave, and resourceful as any man, perhaps more so. They came in all ages and sizes and shapes and backgrounds, but they all worked together as one. Oh, thank the Lord for the sisters who could create a palatable meal out of anything between a, a seagull lily and boot leather. <laughs> yes, the brethren had to endure heat, thirst, bad water, the wind, the elements, occasional desperation of spirit. And the sisters had to endure all of that and the brethren. May the Lord bless them. The Vanguard Company of 1847 consisted of 143 men and just three women. But those women were followed by thousands more. They were women pioneering out of necessity, leaving homes and loved ones back east or across the sea to face the unknown. Their faith was framed in resourcefulness and resilience. They scavenged for food, traded with Indians, and recycled rags into clothes. They bore and buried their babies across the plains, and they often did it alone. 
they had it a little different again from the average Gentile or Anglo woman on the trail. Mormon women often migrated with their children and without a husband because the husband might be serving in the Mormon battalion or off on a religious mission. So there are many, many cases of women heading families. Also, the poverty and the lack of supplies among the Mormon trains certainly affected the women to a great extent. There were women who were pregnant who pulled hand carts to Utah or put a sick baby on top of supplies in a hand cart and walked across that trail to Utah. They encountered things that Gentile women wouldn't even wanted to have or dreamed of even in their worst nightmares. We decided that the pioneers don't have bad hair days. They just had bad hair all the time. So we don't care what we look like. Number one quote on television. Yeah. The independent circumstances of the women on the trail today are strikingly similar to 150 years ago. Of the 151 people traveling the full distance, nine women are alone, and five more are alone on the trail with children. I, don't, I can't explain the pull that I feel towards being out here. There's nowhere else I'd rather be. Believe me, I laid awake for two months, literally. I laid awake at night. Pros, cons, go, don't go, foolish nonsense, once in a lifetime chance. So here I am. One of the things I've really struggled with since I've been a single parent is, um, you know, what could I do that I wouldn't be able to do if I wasn't in this situation? And this is really one of them. One of the things that's like a once in a lifetime uh, opportunity to sort of test your mettle. Um, not just physically, but um, emotionally and spiritually. And, uh, and I'm always up for that kind of a challenge. Um, I spent the last 10 years of my life working 60, 80 hours a week. And I just decided that it's something I really wanted to do and decided that I needed to enjoy my life. Anyone who is out here has had to make the commitment that this is top priority in their life. I tried to get ready to come. I felt like I was Cinderella getting ready for the ball because my family would not assume my responsibilities to enable me to get ready to go. They felt like, well, when you're gone, then we'll do it. I stayed up all night before I left to come out here. And at one point, I thought, I just can't go. And I thought, well, if I were to die, I would go. And this is just as important to me as dying. And that's the only thing that made me walk out the door and do it, and that's how big my passion is. I don't have the petticoats, and uh, you know, usually they would have had a skirt like this, and they would have had slips and petticoats and a lot more underneath it to get caught on stuff. There were a lot of accidents uh, originally with women, uh, and I, I strongly believe it was a function of the clothing they wore. <laughs> Though the days were often dull, there were other times when the excitement was almost more than these prairie women needed, as Rachel Lee found out near the end of her journey. As she walked beside her wagon, delighting in the wind that cooled her a little as she trudged along, an unexpected gust whipped her skirts into the wagon wheel. Before Rachel knew it, her skirts were being wrapped around and around the hub. She screamed for help as she tried to extricate them, but in an instant they were being drawn so tight that she could only grasp two spokes in her hands, her feet between two others, and make a complete revolution with the wheel. The wagon was finally stopped, and Rachel found herself almost right side up, but still tightly bound to the wheel. Everyone gathered around, trying to decide how to get her loose. There was no question of cutting her clothing, as that would mean one less item for wear that she needed badly. Her shoes were unlaced. Then, as one woman held a blanket to protect her from curious eyes, she was plucked from skirt, petticoats, and shoes, clean as though they were skinning the legs of a chicken. Later, as the clothing was easily removed from the wheel and in the privacy of her wagon, Rachel shook them free of wrinkles and put them on again. As she took up her walk again, she kept a wary distance from the wheels.
I'm a convert to the church, and um, I wanted to come out here and, and just show appreciation for the to the pioneers that came. I, I feel like I feel like they're mine too, and um, I also want to build a legacy for my own family. We're the first generation in my family that that are members, and this just seemed like a really exciting opportunity to do that. And I just wanted to come out and have some fun. It's been really nice being on my own, but a lot of these guys, you know, they don't expect to find women teamsters, and so I know a lot of them were kind of not really knowing what to expect from me, but now I've pretty much shown that I, I do kind of know what I'm doing. And <laughs> sometimes I wish I had more help than others. <laughs> I've got a lot of determined ancestors behind me, and so I, I have the, I'm like taking on the determination that I'm going to make it. And, by myself or with help, it's, you know, <laughs> I'm still going to make it. We have one lady uh, here with her four daughters. Uh, Christina's 11, Emily's 13, and Jennifer's 15, and then I have an older son who's 26, Rob. And um, I'm just in awe of her, even though she's not a horsewoman herself and admits it. Just, I mean, it'll be, it won't even be light out yet. You know, and I, I'm staggering around there trying to get my horse saddled, and which is all I have to do basically. And she's out there with a fire, cooking oatmeal. You know, and we all have to be ready to go at the same time. <laughs> so she had to get up a lot earlier than I did. It must have been so hard. There have been times, even though we've we've been so many people around us, you know, there's so many people on the train. Um, I've gone back to my tent sometimes at night and thought, can I really do this? Can I, can I carry on to the end? Um, because I'm really, you know, really beginning to, to miss my family. And I thought, well, that was partly one of the reasons I came out here too, was um, to test my endurance <laughs> and so I could give my own children something to to look back on you know, and say, well, you know, mum enjoyed this, you know, we can enjoy this that we're facing in our life, you know. So. Just because I'm a mom and I have to bring my child along with me, then I do. I want her to experience everything she can experience. If she can come on this trip and experience all these things that we do and, and know that there's a freedom and know that there's a, a faith, she's got to feel the spirit. She's got to feel it too, even at four. Then maybe she'll go out. Maybe she'll be an a adventure seeker. Maybe she'll be somebody that won't be afraid to step out and do something if she's been a part of it. If she knows that, well, Mom wasn't afraid. Mom took me when I was four, and, and we went, and we camped, and we did the hand carts and stuff, and she wasn't afraid to do it. So maybe when the time comes and she's got to be strong in the church over some reason or she's got to do something, maybe, maybe she'll be, I can only hope and pray she'll be strong enough to say, well, I'll just do it then, you know? and buckle down and do it and have the determination. These women are not just remembering those who have gone before. They're carving out a new legacy of faith to leave to their own posterity. And it's a legacy with a cost, the price of going the trail alone. What is it that kept this people going? Was it the hope for gold and silver and riches on the other end? <laughs> no, not in the least. Was it the fear of persecution, mobocracy, and all the indignities that had been forced upon us by the federal government? No, but that, that got us on the road in the first instance. The thing that kept one foot in front of the other for most of a thousand miles or more was the pure, simple faith in God the Eternal Father, that he had prepared a place for us, that there was a place where we could go and worship him without any interference, our holy home. Let Zion in her beauty rise, her light begins to shine. Ere long her king will rend the skies, majestic and divine. The gospel spreading through the land, a people to prepare to meet the Lord and in expand, triumphant in the air. 
He heralds sound the gospel trump to earth's remotest bound. Go spread the news from pole to pole in all the nations round. That Jesus in the clouds above with hosts of angels too will soon appear his saints to save his enemies subdue. That glorious rest will then commence, which prophets did foretell, when Christ will reign with saints on earth and in their presence dwell. A thousand years, O glorious day, dear Lord, prepare my heart to stand with thee on Zion's mount and never more to part. Then when the thousand years are past and Satan is unbound, O Lord, preserve us from his grasp by fire from heaven sent down. Until our great last change shall come to immortalize this clay. 